So fight scenes are super, super common across all types of media and all types of fiction. And there's a bunch of different types of fight scenes as well. There's one-on-one -on -one attacks and duels. There's one kung fu master versus a dozen evil henchmen. There's fights where characters are running away and have to kind of fight their way out while they're doing so. There's superpower matchups. There's gun duels. I mean, the, the sky really is the limit here. That said, a lot of fights in all sorts of media are just really, really, really bad. Like, it's always obvious when the people writing slash directing slash choreographing the fights just don't know what they're doing at all. And no one is there to teach them. So that's why I'm making this video. Like, that's why I'm going, hey, let's just talk about fight scenes a little bit. Let's see if I can get some advice out there, which will make things a little bit better. And this is mostly going to be aimed at writers, but I think there's some advice here that could work for other people as well. And we could just talk about it, but that sounds a little boring, so let's be more visual today. So we're outside. Now, the first thing you need to ask is who is in conflict and why? Is it just a couple of friends who are mad at each other and started swinging? Is it a bar fight? Is it a supervised boxing match between bitter rivals? Or is it a fight to the death? The motivation behind things is what makes the audience care, and caring is what makes them entertained. Like, if it's visual form, and you're just seeing two characters fight. Okay, really? Is it? We're, we're speeding right through neighborhood? If it's visual medium, like a movie, and we're just watching characters fight, you can get away with thinner plot and characters, but you can't really do that in written form. Like whether it's comic book, there's just still images, or an actual book where it's just words. You just can't get away with that. You need to have some motivation. And by having motivation, it makes it easier to get into the characters' heads, and so they, you can really feel the fear, the exhaustion, the determination, and whatever else is going through there. And that is how you get the audience invested. Being in a fight, and I, I don't just mean a fight to the death, but any sort of fight at all, is exhausting and tiring and kind of scary. If you want the audience to actually know why the characters are going to all this trouble, you gotta spend some time on it, and they have to know why they're going to all this trouble if you want them to care. The mindset of somebody who's trying to defeat an opponent in boxing, even if it's somebody they really hate, is going to be different than somebody who's trying to kill a stranger who's running at them with an axe. Like, it, it's gonna be night and day. But that's all just set up for the fight. What about what happens during the fight itself? If you'd like, you can think of it as emotional narrative, which is like, why people are doing it, and technical narrative, which is what happens. That's pretty basic, though. You should also be wondering, like, what do the people involved actually know about fighting? Or more specifically, what do the people involved know about the type of fighting that is relevant? See, John Wick is great at what he does, but if you put him in some plate armor and expected him to fight some knights, he probably wouldn't do that well. Similarly, a samurai would be very good at what they do, but if you put them into a modern gunfight, they would probably fail. A lot of my channel focuses on fantasy, and a lot of people watching you probably are working on something fantasy related as well. Meaning there are probably sort of magic powers or superpowers involved. And so you should ask, how can these be incorporated into combat? Something like Mistborn does this very well. You know, for example, they have pewter burning, which increases your body's physical capabilities. So like size, strength, durability, that sort of thing. They also are able to push and pull on metals or even manipulate their opponent's emotions. All of these are very useful in a fight. Now, in a regular real world fight, size and weight matter a lot. I am not going to defeat Dave Bautista in a fight. It's just, it's just not going to happen. He has too much of an advantage. Now, you throw weapons into the mix, or you throw magic into the mix, that changes the calculus quite a bit. That can even the playing field. Because if I can shoot lightning at him, or move at the speed of sound, or even just cut him real bad with one of these, that changes things a lot. It evens the playing field. But however they're fighting and whatever they're fighting with, you need to have knowledge and practice in order to do it effectively. So you should ask yourself, what can the characters involved do? What sort of practice they, do they have? What sort of knowledge do they have? How long have they been doing it? Are they somebody who has been training with Master Swordsman for years, or are they just somebody who picked it up yesterday and barely know what they're doing? Oftentimes, the worst type of person to fight, at least in a fight to the death, is a brave amateur, because they're just gonna come charging right in and not really know what they're doing, and you're just gonna wind up both getting stabbed and both dying, probably. People who know what they're doing tend to act in more predictable ways. But the flip side of that is that if you don't have much experience, then sometimes you can freeze up. Like, a couple of months ago, I actually was in a longsword tournament, and I fought against another guy who I had never met before, and he just unleashed at me. You know, he, he just came in full throttle the whole way, and I'll admit, I kind of froze up, wasn't sure what I was doing, and got hit several times, and I wound up losing that match. But a little while later, I fought that same guy again, and because I knew what 
to expect, and I was expecting, okay, he's gonna come at me with a lot of force, I just gotta counter that. I did better, I still lost, but I did better. But even if you don't freeze up, the characters need to know how to act and how to react if they're going to fight, because way too often I see people writing characters thinking while they're fighting. And that's not something you have time for. They happen real fast, you don't have time to think, you just have time to act and react. That's why training and practice are so important. Anime is particularly bad about this, it'll have characters monologue for like 10 minutes in their heads about what's going on and what they're going to do. Rivers inside you are resisting, trying to rekindle some of your former strength. I won't! Perhaps I was wrong. I refuse to die! You won't be able to stop him head on. Use your wits. That's because... I didn't put my back into it that time! In real life, you've been training for a while, you've seen the exact kind of attack that they're doing a thousand times in a row in training, so you just counter it and follow it up. That's all it is, it's no thinking at all. Now, you don't have to be an aristocrat who trains all day or a monk who lives in a secluded temple in order to get good at this sort of thing. It doesn't take that long to at least learn the basics. Becoming a master, yeah, that takes much longer, but just learning the basics is pretty easy to do, and that's why a lot of people throughout history have done it. Pretty much every culture, every human culture at least, has had some form of martial arts that people have practiced. A lot of them weren't named or codified, and a lot of them have died out as well, but they've always existed. For example, Muay Thai. Now, until recently, that didn't even have a name. The name Muay Thai just translates as Thai boxing, and because before recently, that was just the way that they fought. And then they came into contact with Westerners, and they're like, well, this is kind of like what the boxing you guys do, except it's a Thai version, so they just called it Thai boxing. However, there are a lot of very, very distinct styles, though. For example, you can widely split it into hard arts, which are about striking, and soft arts, which are about grappling. If you want to see differences on how those function, literally just watch an MMA match, because those usually have a lot of both. But then watch that and compare it to, say, a Jackie Chan fight scene, and you'll see it's night and day. And then compare it to, like, a sword fight from most movies. Again, very, very different. The point is, these are all very distinct, there's a lot of different ways of fighting, which all look very different, and come from very different cultures. And obviously, weapons shake that up as well. Like this right here is a longsword. Now I am trained in uh, English longsword specifically, which is different than say French or German or Italian. And English longsword assumes that you and your opponents are both wearing armor. So it has a lot of like really big sweeping motions because you need power to break through steel plate. But there's also English bastard sword, which is the exact same weapon, just used in a different way because bastard sword assumes you and your opponent are not wearing armor. So this one has a lot more really small, brief, quick movements and there's also a bigger emphasis on stabbing, because you don't really need to get through their armor. And those are two distinct styles using the same weapon coming from the same place. Imagine how different it could be if we also started looking at the rest of Europe, or Africa, and the Middle East, or East Asia, or anywhere. The point is, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of different ways you can do this. You generally want to have at least a basic idea of what the fight looks like in your head as you're writing it. Uh, you don't want to describe every attack and every block and everything because that would get tedious pretty quick, but you do want to have at least a general idea of it so you can describe it at least in broad terms. And you also, like I said, you want to know how these characters would fight. So, what sort of culture do they come from and how did they learn? So martial arts, wherever they come from, have generally been developed for one of three reasons. Number one, being for sport. You know, this is something like boxing or western wrestling where you're not really trying to hurt the other guy, you're just doing it for fun. And obviously you can still get pretty badly messed up while doing this, but the intent is not to kill people. The second reason is for self-defense in a civilian context. So this, the staff here, is a Korean bong. And this was, normally they're six feet long, this one's only five feet for some reason, not sure why. But this was originally not a weapon, it was a farm tool. It's something that you use to carry buckets of water. You know, you go out to the well, you put one on each side, and you carry it like this. But if somebody attacks you, then, well, okay, you already have this and you're good to go. You can just start attacking right there. And the third reason they were created was, again, for warfare. English longsword, it's designed to fight somebody using armor. You're not going to see that a lot outside of a battle. There's a lot of overlap between these three different types of styles, but they are still pretty distinct. During World War II, American Marines were really only taught basic boxing and wrestling for close quarters combat. And I mean, that's fine, but it's a life or death scenario in war, so it didn't work super well when they were fighting against Japanese soldiers who 
were much better trained in things like Kenjutsu and Jujutsu. And then during the Vietnam War, some similar things happened, which is why the modern-day Marine Corps Martial Arts program was developed. Now, a lot of times, civilians did not have access to weapons, either for legal reasons or for practical ones. Uh, the Korean bong I just showed you was a farm tool which they just happened to use uh, as a weapon. They learned to use it that way. This is an English quarterstaff, and this is just a weapon. Like, you can see, it's much bigger, much bulkier, it's really difficult to fit inside at all, and so you're probably not going to carry this around all day just on the off chance that somebody might try to start something with you. Generally speaking, people learn to fight with what they had on hand. So ask yourself, what do people carry around in your setting? Is it normal for them to just have knives on their person all the time? Well then they should learn to fight using these. And if someone from that culture does get into a knife battle, they probably won't be really scared and acting like they don't know what they're doing. They're going to be very confident, they'll know exactly what they're trying to do, and they're just going to go for it. They might not be the best at it, but they'll know what they're doing. In France, people actually dueled to the death so often that the government forbid carrying swords or guns around in public, so people learned to fight using canes, which were pretty normal. There's an entire school of martial arts built around fighting with these things, which I know nothing about. I know there's whacking, and I know that you can use this top handle to like grip and pull people, but I don't know anything else about it. In Brazil, slaves were not allowed to wield weapons or practice martial arts because their masters were afraid they would use it in a rebellion. So they developed capoeira, which is a martial arts style which was dis disguised as a dance. So if you want to know what sort of weapons people have or and how they would fight, then ask yourself what sort of resources and technology they have available to make those weapons, and then look at the limitations they have and how they work around that. Wait a minute, did James trick us into watching another world building video? Yes he did, now shut up and listen. American Indians didn't have metalworking, so they didn't have long swords or plate armor or anything like that. They made their weapons out of things like wood and bone and rock. Polynesian people often didn't even have rock that they could use properly. They had to make weapons out of wood a lot of the time. Like Polynesian war paddles are still deadly, but they are made of wood. And sometimes they would actually put shark's teeth on the sides of it so it could also cut and stab. And in all situations, you should always be thinking of improvised weapons. This right here is an escrima. It is just a stick. Like you could be walking through the woods or the jungle or something, get ambushed, and pick up a branch that looks exactly like this and use it to fight bad guys. Unless you are a bad guy, in which case you'd probably be using it to fight good guys, but that's not important. And because this sort of object is so common, it was an improvised weapon that just became a regular weapon. Now you just make these, and theoretically people could just carry these around, because they're real light, they're small, they're easy to keep with you. This, on the other hand, is a gunstock war club, which was developed in a similar way. Uh, basically what happened was, before the bayonet was invented, but after people started using muskets in battle, uh, if your opponent came up close to you and you didn't have time to reload, what you would do is you would flip it up so you hold it by the barrel and then you just swing it at them. And Europeans did this while they were fighting against native tribes in what is now the northeastern United States, and they thought, oh, it's a good idea, so they just carved their own out of wood. This one's actually made of polymer, but <laughs> they carved them out of wood, and they added a blade to the tip of it. And a lot of times the spikes on these things was just made from kitchen knives or other stuff that the natives either traded with or stole from white people. And actually, this one only has one st spike, but sometimes they'd have three or four or even more. People are smart. I mean, both individuals and societies. They are smart. If you give them something, they will find a way to make use of it. And as an added bonus, if you're unfamiliar with a weapon or a style, you're not going to be totally sure how to counter it. So if somebody comes at you with something like this, you're going to hesitate for a split second and not be sure what to do. And a split second is all it takes. So take all of that into account. What sort of society do your characters come from? What, if any, experience or resources do they have? And from that you can tell what they would, or how they would fight, and how well they would fight, and what they would fight with. Now, terrain is super important, arguably more important than the combatants themselves, because terrain can be muddy, you can get stuck, it can be slippery, and you can fall. It can be dark or misty, so it restricts your vision. If you're in the woods or something, then there's roots to trip you, branches to restrict your movement. If you're indoors, there's things like furniture and tables and things that can trip you up. Strike! Run. Run. Oh! And that is exactly why we say you must maintain a small stance. This is nice terrain out here, and you still slipped on your butt. Yeah. If you're out in rough terrain, nasty, it's wet, it's snowy, or there's objects on the ground, you'll do that in front of your opponent and you will die. Way too many people write fight scenes as if they're happening in empty flat rings, and that's just not how real battles happen at all. Because if I'm fighting someone on something like this, this is just grass, and it's mostly flat, 
then that's gonna be quite a bit different than if we're both in waist deep water and we're kind of sinking into the mud. And like, if you fall under the water in that situation, you're done. And that's the point I'm getting at. Use the obstacles to your advantage because if you're not paying attention to them in a fight, then you could trip or otherwise get in a bad situation and then your opponent will finish you off. But you can also use that to your advantage. You can trip them up. If you're fighting more than one person, you can sort of get them into a situation where they can only come at you one at a time. Like there's a million different ways to do this. Throwing and grappling are also really important things to consider when it comes to terrain and obstacles. Because uh, some of you watching this have probably done something like wrestling or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or something like that where there's a lot of throwing and grappling. But when you practice that, it's on a mat usually. So if somebody throws you or otherwise gets you onto the mat, that kind of hurts, but it's not that bad. Whereas if you do it out here on this grass, which is you know kind of soft, but there's like hard dirt underneath it, and that's gonna hurt some more. If you go right over there to the sidewalk or the street, so you're falling on asphalt and concrete, we're talking broken bones and concussions if you get thrown to the ground. So these are really important things to consider. All in all, fight scenes should pretty much never be fought in empty spaces, like just blank, empty voids. That's not how it should work. Something that's actually very similar to terrain, but not quite the same, is what the combatants are wearing and how they're feeling. Now, right now, I am wearing this gambeson. It's basically just a thick padded jacket. It's a type of armor, you know, like it's not going to stop something heavy like a battle axe, but it can stop something small like a knife. And if it's a, a wound that would otherwise be fatal, can turn into a minor one because this is pretty thick. The main problem with it is not just that it's kind of bulky and heavy, nothing too awful, but that it's hot. Like it's actually pretty early in the morning. That sun beating down on me is killing me, man. And I haven't even really fought anybody in this right now. And if, if you don't believe me, just put on a winter coat and then run on a treadmill for a couple of minutes and see how you feel afterwards. You're not gonna be at your best. I also have these lovely gauntlets on and these do a great job protecting my hands. But if I drop something, if I drop my weapon while I'm wearing these, I need to take them off to pick it back up. And I can tell you that from firsthand experience. I also have this lovely mask, which will protect my head in the event of it getting hit by something. But you can also see it's covering up my face, so it kind of restricts my vision. Not a lot, not by as much as like, you know, knights with their plate helmets and they have just that little thin visor to see through. It's not restricting it that much, but it is still restricting it. Now, if I had to put all that on and then I fought somebody right now, it would be okay. It would still be uncomfortable, but it would be okay at the end of the day. But if I was marching all day, didn't have enough water, had barely eaten, and then I had to fight an entire battle at the end of it, which could last for a couple of minutes or it could last for hours and hours, I'm not going to be at my best. In fact, people are very rarely at 100% when it comes to physical activity. What if you get attacked when you're on your way home from work and you're really tired? Or what if you have not eaten properly in a week and you're working your way through a blizzard? Or what if you're sick and you're searching for a magical cure or anything like that? That's going to beat down on you. You know, you're not going to be at your best when you're like that. And that comes back to what I was saying earlier. Get inside the characters' heads and make the audience feel what they are feeling. As an example, what is more interesting? Somebody who's in perfect shape, effortlessly cutting down their opponents with a flurry of fancy moves that they had no trouble doing, or somebody who can barely stand deciding to dig down deep, grab the last vesti vestiges of their strength, and fight off somebody who wants to make them one more in a long line of corpses. Because I know what's more interesting to me. And at the end of the day, fighting somebody, trying to hurt them, is a difficult thing to do. Like, you have to overcome some mental barriers because most people don't want to hurt each other, and they especially don't want to kill each other. That said, very few things annoy me more in fiction than when people fight with deadly weapons, like swords, and nobody gets killed or even seriously hurt during it. Like, th this one's blunted, but if it were sharp, you pull it out when you are going to kill somebody. It's not for threatening them, it's not for trying to cut off their hand and disable them, or turn the flat of the blade so you hit them in the head and knock them unconscious, which is an actual thing I've seen done before. It's a, God, it's so stupid. Like, you are pulling it out to kill them. Because even if you only give them a minor wound, it can get infected, or they can bleed to death. Like, no matter what you do, there is a very real chance that the other person will die. In fact, there's a greater chance that they will die than that they will live. And so you do not hold back, and you do not limit yourself by only attacking non-vital areas. Because if you do that, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage, and you will most likely die. When it comes down to a fight to the death, it is you or the other person. And if you're not going to choose you, then you may as well just give up. You have to be a little bit of a psychopath to be good at fighting at the end of the day. Now, I've been talking about realism and using real martial arts as a template for this entire video, but does realism really matter? Like, does your fight scene being more realistic make it better? 
it depends. Recently, I did a video on the live action One Piece series, which you should check out if you get a chance. It's a very good show. And the fight scenes in that are pretty over the top. Like there's people doing flips, people getting kicked uh, through buildings, people destroying stuff. It's it's pretty over the top. It's not realistic in the slightest. But One Piece is also a very goofy series, you know? People who are half fish or people who have bodies made of rubber are pretty commonplace there. So seeing them do all this crazy stuff, it it checks out. In fact, if they decided to be dark and gritty and realistic just during the fight scenes, it would be strange. You know, it, it wouldn't really fit the tone. But on the other end of that spectrum, if we have someone like, say, John Wick suddenly start running up buildings and punching through w concrete walls and stuff, it would be weird and it just wouldn't fit. What I'm getting at is that tone is far more important than anything else. That said, when people say those big flashy moves you see in kung fu movies and martial arts and stuff, those usually aren't used in a real fight. But I do want to point out that those still serve an actual purpose. Like, I got my quarterstaff again, and like spinning this thing around over my head and such, like, this probably isn't going to be used in a real fight, but it is still teaching me something. You know, it's serving a purpose. It's teaching me balance and control. It's making it so I'm less likely to lose control of this thing or drop it during a real fight. And when you see Kung Fu masters doing like flying kicks and stuff, well, that's the same thing. Those sorts of things can also be useful as an intimidation tactic. Like you see in Kung Fu movies, sometimes people right before they fight, they'll do like a hundred flashy moves just by themselves and then get into a fighting stance. What they're saying there is, hey, I know what I'm doing, don't try to start anything with me, and that is a very real thing for martial arts. Like, if I do this, I'm saying, don't fuck with me. I have the power of God and anime on my side. Fight scenes are just one way of showcasing conflict that can happen in all sorts of different stories, and the tone of the fight scene should match the tone of the story. So that's where I'm gonna leave you. Just make sure everything matches up. See you later, subscribe and stuff. Also, I might do a world-building martial arts video later if people are interested. Goodbye. Wait. Don't click away, I know you think the video is over, and that these are just the end credits, but we have a sniper nearby, he's aiming directly at your head. If you click away, you're gonna die. All these names here are my patrons, these are the people that send me money once a month over on Patreon. If you want to get stuff like early access to videos, then consider, you know, doing that, becoming one of these guys. And a special thanks to my $10 and up patrons who are Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santotis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Chibs Ahoy, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Flax, James M, Karkat Kitsune, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Microphone, Mistboy, Mitsimona, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Psych Excess, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Ve Victus, and Wesley. I truly could not do this without all of you, and you know, you're great. Thank you, thank you so much for watching. Uh, after this, once the video is over, you can click away. The sniper will not kill you. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.